All right, so this is chapter five in the text. It's talking about the, um, the border around uh, every cell, which is this plasma membrane. We kind of talked about this in uh, last week when we were talking about plasma membranes being composed of lipids of various kinds with uh, proteins spanning that uh, plasma membrane layer as well. So this is an electron microscopy photograph of a plasma membrane and the intercellular space. So plasma membranes are incredibly important. Um, you kind of need to know some of their major functions, which is to keep the goods concentrated while keeping harmful materials out. So basically your cell has a bunch of stuff that your cell wants to keep inside of it and there's a bunch of stuff outside the cell that the cell does not want inside of it and in order to be able to do this successfully this whole life thing the cell needs to be able to take some stuff in and keep some stuff out and that's going to require the ability to transport stuff in but also remove wastes from the cell it's also going to require communicating with other cells as well. So if you think about this in terms of an organism, many of your cells are going to be needing to communicate to one another so that they can coordinate their activities, so they can make proteins at the right time, so that they can do the right thing at the right time, so that they can not divide if the region that they're in is um, too compact or there's too many cells there. This is true of uh, free living organisms as well that are single cellular or whatever. They need to be able to communicate with one another in order to know what's out there or maybe in order to um, sometimes identify a threat maybe to produce some kind of um, toxin or maybe if you're a bacteria to form a capsule um, but these are some of the things that the plasma membrane is going to help with so here's a picture of the plasma membrane like we talked about in that lipid section you have these phospholipid heads which are hydrophilic they like water and then you have these uh, fatty tails which are hydrophobic so they're in here hiding away from the water so here's the inside of the cell here's the outside of the cell and both of these are kind of aqueous both of these have water in them uh, you also have cholesterol all right this is a, a protein uh, that is or excuse me uh, cholesterol is not a protein it is a lipid <laughs> so you have these lipids embedded within your plasma membrane and you have these uh, proteins. This is called an integral protein because it is integrated into the plasma membrane. You have this peripheral protein because it's kind of in the periphery. It, it doesn't go all the way through. And you have these, these little glycocalyx things which are attached to proteins. These have uh, various functions in um, bacteria. Uh, but the plasma membrane, as you can see, there's a lot going on. It's more than just phospholipids. It's more than just like a fatty layer that's separating uh, the cell. Uh, from the rest of the environment. It's not too certainly, but there's lots of stuff going on here. So here's a micrograph of a, of a plasma membrane, and then here's an artist's rendering of it that kind of has some of these same details. Maybe these proteins are being uh, sort of supported by cytoskeletal filaments. Not that big of a deal for you guys right now, but just kind of know there is a hydrophobic region. That's the outside region. It's this here. It could also, it's also the inside region because both the inside and outside are watery. Okay, so that's hydrophobic. There's also a hydro, uh, I mean, hydro, this is hydrophilic, excuse me. The outside and inside are hydrophilic. They like water because this is watery out here or in here, and this is watery out here. You also have a hydrophilic or hydrophobic region. Oh my goodness. A hydrophobic region, and you can tell it's hydrophobic because it's inside here hiding away from the water. And you're going to have um, some lipids, you're going to have some cholesterol stuck in here as well, and you're going to have some protein, you're going to have some protein stuck in here in addition. These, these glycocalyx, by the way, are also uh, partially carbohydrate. So pretty much everyone except for nucleic acids are getting in on the um, plasma membrane party. So there are four basic components of the plasma membrane, and we're going to start by talking about the phospholipid bilayer. It's two fatty acid chains and a polar um, phosphate group attached to a glycerol. This is a kind of review from that previous lecture. Uh, but you have a glycerol, you have fatty acid chains um, attached to it, 
and you're going to have a whole bunch of those all stacked together to form your plasma membrane. Okay, the heads are pointed out and the tails are pointed in, like I was just saying a minute ago. The heads like water, the tails do not like water. And then we need to talk about the permeability of this bilayer. We need to talk about the permeability of the plasma membrane. So the lipid center prevents things from getting in. It prevents large molecules, prevents hydrophilic molecules because it's hydrophobic and it doesn't want them in there. But it allows nonpolar hydrophobic and small molecules to pass through. So this, this uh, bilayer region is preventing most things from getting in or out of the cell. And again, here is the, the polar head. This part is the part that likes water. Here's your nonpolar tails, and here are your polar heads over here. You have your watery external fluid and your watery cytosol or internal fluid. And like I was saying, this, this prevents things that the cell does not want inside it from getting in. It's kind of like ricocheting a moth, and it prevents things that the cell wants to keep inside of here from getting out. See, it can't go anywhere. Some stuff can cross through, but most stuff um, can't go in or out. So cholesterol prevents the passage of some small molecules and adds a, a, a certain amount of fluidity to the plasma membrane. It keeps it so that it is more or less, um, well, less fluid, <laughs> actually. So it, it keeps it so that there is an increased amount of fluidity. You do not want a rigid um, plasma membrane. You, don't, you want it so that things are able to uh, transfer through when the cell wants them to. You also have proteins stuck in your plasma membrane. You have these integral proteins, which uh, the definition of an integral protein means it goes from one side of that membrane to the other. Let's go back. So this would be like an integral protein here because it goes all the way from one side to the other. And um, you have uh, peripheral proteins as well, which don't pass all the way through. Um, each of these have a very diverse range of functions in the plasma membrane. Um, they do everything from like uh, allowing passage of certain chemicals in to again increasing the fluidity to anchoring things like the glycocalyx, etc. Um, like I was just saying, <laughs> those those proteins have many different uh, functions, structural support. Uh, recognition is one that I forgot about. It allows uh, the cells to identify what's foreign. Um, as we're probably going to talk about later, this is involved in the immune system, is this notion of recognition. It allows cells to communicate with one another and with external signals. And transport, that's the one I mentioned, it allows molecules to pass in and out. So here are some different uh, proteins that have some of these different functions. You see here that this, this piece kind of fits with this protein, and this protein is going to be able to recognize whatever this thing is. They can communicate. I assume that this is trying to show that these are like neurotransmitters. So it's sending off these little signaling molecules to some other cell that can either, you know, recognize them with another protein or absorb them and figure out, oh, hey, something's going on. There's also transport, and this protein is just allowing stuff to come in or out of the cell. And I almost forgot structural support, so here's a protein, peripheral protein, that's been anchored with these cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal um, uh, portions here. So it, it's, it is helping to support the cell itself. So the glycocalyx, this is, this is a thing, we've, we've seen a picture of it, we've seen a couple of pictures of them. These happen in bacteria a lot, and they're, it's, it's sugar, it's a carbohydrate that protrudes from lipids and proteins. And this has binding sites that allow bacteria to sort of communicate and recognize uh, one another. It lubricates the cells so that they can move around uh, more, free, more freely. And sometimes it even helps to stick cells down so that they can stay in one place if they want to. So uh, this is kind of a, a big idea and a bit of a gear shift from what we were talking about. But in order for things to come in and out of a cell, you, you need to have this notion of diffusion. And all diffusion is, is movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So kind of the way I like to think about it is, if I were to come into a lab on Monday, 
and say, all right, everybody, go go stand in the corner and make you guys all stand very close to one another in very close proximity. And then I were to just leave the room, you would all probably diffuse throughout the room until you were roughly equidistant from one another. You would all move around the room until you weren't awkwardly standing shoulder to shoulder with one another in the corner. So molecules have the same same kind of property where if you put a whole bunch of something in one area, it's going to tend to diffuse away. It's going to tend to diffuse away until it is an equal concentration everywhere throughout the solution. And I have a picture of this in just a second. But uh, this is connected to this notion of concentration gradient, which is the difference between the highest and lowest concentration of a solute. Okay, so the tendency is, again, for molecules to travel from high concentration, where there's a whole bunch of things, to low concentration, where there are fewer things. So here's a picture. If we take some uh, dye, we drop it in here. The dye is going to spread out. It's going to diffuse throughout the liquid until it is evenly distributed. You've probably all seen something like this happening before. So you start out with high concentration, and then it moves out um, until it is an equal concentration everywhere. So things can diffuse through these membranes that we've been talking about. Um, so your membranes are what is referred to as semi-permeable membranes. Semi-permeable membranes. So they're semi-permeable because they allow small molecules and uncharged particles through them. Okay, this is also going to be uh, connected to water here very shortly because we're going to have membranes that allow water to pass through them but do not allow other things to pass through them. And sort of all tied up in this is this idea of osmosis. This idea of osmosis. So um, osmosis is the net movement of water across a semi permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. Okay, and the whole thing about osmosis is it's water moving from low concentration to high concentration. So wherever solute goes, water is sure to follow. And I, I have a picture of this in just a moment. But osmosis is incredibly important uh, to animals um, and plants, to, to most life actually. So if you are in an area that has a bunch of salt, you have a bunch of um, solute dissolved there, water is going to exit your cells. Okay, water will exit your cells and follow wherever that um, solute happens to be. And, and so, by the way, if I were to take a, a big glass of sweet tea or something like that, and I were to open a bag of sugar and pour the sugar into it, the sugar would be the solute. Solutes are things that get dissolved. And the sweet tea would be the solvent. Solvents are things that do the dissolving. So here is a pretty nice picture of osmosis and how it works. So you see here, we have two solvents, little cups of water, and they're, they're at equal levels. We also have a semi-permeable membrane. And what this semi-permeable membrane does is it's going to allow water to pass through. So the semi-permeable membrane allows water to move through. So then what we've done is we've taken on one side of this and we've increased the concentration of salt. We just poured a whole bunch of salt into it. And so what will happen ultimately is that water is going to transfer from this left side here to this right side through osmosis. Wherever solute goes, water is sure to follow. Water is and you can't see, but I'm putting up air quotes right now. Water is trying to equalize the concentration between these two areas. Water is trying to equalize the concentration between this cup and this cup. And since this cup on this side has a bunch more salt in it, its concentration is higher. So because its concentration is higher, water is going to move from the left to the right over to here. Um, osmosis also happens in cells. So if you were to take um, a plant cell or an um, animal cell, plant and an animal cell, excuse me, and you were to put them in a, in a, in a region or in a, like a cup or something, a petri dish or whatever, that had a low 
um, salt concentration or a low concentration of anything. You put these cells into something that has a low concentration, where is the concentration then going to be higher? So if there's nothing out here external to the cell, the concentration's high inside the cell. And so water is going to rush in and cause this cell to burst. Cell's done. This cell's fine with it. It has a cell wall, so it just becomes what's called turgid or filled with water. And plants love this. But this is the reason. This is the reason why, when whenever you get um, hooked up to an IV, there is saline in there and not just pure water. Because if there was just pure water, your cells would explode. Okay, your cells would just be done for. If you take a human cell and put it into some saline where there are equal concentrations of solutes on the inside and out, it'll be great. It'll be what's called isotonic. Nothing will happen. Same thing with the plant. Plants are fine with this. But then lastly over here, I don't know why I read them from right to left, but I did. Um, if you take an animal cell or a plant cell and you put it into a, a region or you put it into a cup or whatever, where there is high concentration outside, what's the water going to do? The water is going to follow that solute. It's going to go where the concentration is higher. And so what happens is you wind up having um, your cell deflate. And I'm going to talk about this again in lab this week um, for a few minutes, just to make sure everybody's crystal clear on it. But there are the absolute basics of osmosis and diffusion. Okay. So in order to get things um, across a cell, you have two, two basic things that you can do. Um, we're going to start with passive transport. Passive transport involves that thing we just talked about, which is diffusion, because the membrane is somewhat permeable. Some things can travel travel through here just, just by diffusion. So they were in a region of high concentration, somewhere maybe outside the cell. And because they were in high concentration, they could just pass into the cell. You also have facilitated diffusion, which is a similar idea. But some of the things that are doing, that are moving via facilitated diffusion are too large. They're too large to get through the plasma membrane. And so what your cell has done is it's taken and put a integral protein there, one type of integral protein, that allows a passageway for these larger molecules to get through. Okay? So they can travel down their concentration gradient, uh, which might not have been clear from um, my previous part of this lecture, but they're traveling from a region of high, concent or low con high concentration to low concentration, and that's how they are traveling into the cell. But for facilitated diffusion, they were too big to get in, so they needed that that um, that protein. You also have active transport, which is fundamentally different. Active transport takes energy. So molecules have to pass across the membrane up their concentration gradient. So they are going from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. And that is the opposite of what things typically do in nature. And so if you want to do the opposite, if you want to not go with the flow, it's going to cost you some energy. So active transport requires the expenditure of energy, and it does the, kind of the opposite of what normally happens. It goes from a uh, uh, low concentration to high concentration. So typically that is from outside the cell to inside the cell. So here a picture of each of these things. You have these small particles that are that are just diffusing into the cell because they're high concentration out here and they're low concentration in here. You have facilitated diffusion, which is this that protein I was talking about, that integral protein um, that has a passageway for things. And this is just a diffusion process. Things are high concentration out here, and they're just diffusing in. And then lastly, over here, you have active transport. And what's going to happen is this thing is going to allow these molecules to come in, but it's also going to take energy in order to get them into the cell. So active transport requires energy. Facilitated diffusion and simple diffusion do not, because they are passive transport. Um, this is just an example of active transport. This is a thing called the sodium-potassium pump, and it's using this to basically get a charge going inside of your cell so that it, you can create uh, ATP. I'm not going to belabor this one. It's just an example. Check out the notes. Look at this. It's just an example 
of transport. So if you want to get big stuff in or out of your cell, there are other mechanisms that you can use, things called exocytosis, endocytosis, penocytosis, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and phagocytosis. Okay, So endocytosis is the movement of materials out of the cell by fusion of vesicles with the plasma membrane. So literally what's going to happen here is you have some large thing inside of your cell. It's inside this vesicle, and the vesicle looks kind of like the plasma membrane. And that plasma membrane is actually going to become part of uh, your, the, the vesicle is going to become part of the plasma membrane, and as a result is going to allow anything inside of it to be released. Okay, exocytosis. Endocytosis is kind of the opposite process. So it's the infolding of the plasma membrane to bring large materials into the cell. Okay, so exo is exit, endo is enter. You also have uh, uh, penocytosis, uh, which I'm not going to uh, worry about as much, but it, it's called cell drinking. This is used in uh, your digestive tract. We also have mediator uh, <laughs> receptor-mediated endocytosis. Uh, which is kind of a, a more specific thing where you have um, basically a receptor capturing ligand and concentrating it into an invaginating pit. And, and I can go into more detail about that in lab if you would like. Uh, and then lastly, we have this phagocytosis, which is cell eating, um, which is how the human immune system uh, eats bacteria. This is also how um, amoebas eat is this phagocytosis. So here's a picture of endocytosis, or I'm sorry, exocytosis, and you can see you have this vesicle here, and the vesicle looks quite a bit like our plasma membrane. You have all these large particles in here, and this vesicle is actually going to fuse with the plasma membrane and cause these things to be released. Okay. They, they were stuck inside the cell. They couldn't just exit because the plasma membrane wouldn't let them out. So what you had to do is you, you have to put them into a vesicle, and the vesicle has to come and actually fuse with the plasma membrane. So here's some electron microscopy of exocy exocytosis. So this is penocytosis, which is basically just endocytosis, but for liquids. This is your body's, or not your body necessarily, but this is, this is cells' way of bringing in um, liquids. Okay, so this is just a form of endocytosis for liquid. You have receptor-mediated endocytosis, and what's happening here is you have these receptors on your cell surface, these are protein receptors, and what's going to happen is these things that the cell wants to bring in, these molecules are going to come and bind to each of these receptors. And after they have bound to these receptors, your cell is going to start to form a vesicle and bring them all in. Okay, So the, media, or the, the molecules have to land on these receptors. Your body recognizes them. I keep saying your body. Your, the cell recognizes them and then brings them in. Okay, then you have phagocytosis, which is cellular eating. Okay, this happens in um, your intestines. This also happens, like I was saying, in, um, in amoebas. Okay, so it, it's the cell bringing in food particles, sometimes whole organisms, um, using pseudopodia. Okay, the pseudopodia surround it and then ultimately invaginate it um, into, the, into a vesicle, if you see here. 